Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We gather together as your church as a grateful people, Father. We sing these songs, Father, proclaiming your majesty and your glory, Father, because we are aware that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Father, we gather here this morning to proclaim your praise and to receive from you through your word. So, Father, I pray now that you would do that, that you would faithfully attend the preaching of your word. Help us to hear you speaking to us, you, the living God of the universe, you who created all things and sustain all things. Now, Father, we ask you to speak to us through your word. Help us, Father. Help us, God, to hear, Lord, to lean in, to anticipate the speaking of the living God. Help us to apply it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please read with me in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Well, we've got a lot to do today, so we're going to dive right in. This morning, we are going to talk about the gospel and parenting. We are going to talk about passing the gospel on from one generation to the next. We're going to talk about how the gospel affects the way that children and, re- and parents relate to one another in the home. Now, I want to I want to do something a little different here this morning. John, John got me all excited about people standing up and being recognized. So I want to ask all the children in the room... Up through, and, and we'll, we'll use a different term, for, and teenagers, through age 18. So if you're 18 or younger, I want you to stand up for just a moment. I'm not going to call you to the front. I just want everybody to stand up. Everybody 18 or younger. All right, so everybody 18 or younger. So everybody is looking around. And as you look around at these kids, I want you to be aware of something. So I'm not typically a big statistics guy, but statistics say that by the age of 20, by the second year of college, eight out of the 10 kids that you see standing around you, not necessarily in this room, but statistically speaking, will have left the church. So if we wanted to display that visually, everybody in this section can sit down, and everybody on this side of the room can sit down, and this is about what we've got left over here. All right, so you guys can sit down. Thank you guys so much. That's John's fault. He wanted everybody to stand up today. So now that we're getting our exercise, I want to point to some. So that's a, that is a stunning statistic. That's, a, that's an alarming statistic. And I'm not, again, I'm not a statistics guy. They're not rules. Uh, they, are not, uh, they are not deterministic. Uh, but that reveals a crisis of generational, you know, of passing the, the gospel on from one generation to the next in our world today. That reveals a crisis of family discipleship in the home. Now, we certainly want to hope and pray that our little church breaks this trend, and we have good hope that we will, because our confidence is not in our ability to do things. Our confidence is in God's ability and God's faithfulness to his word, God's faithfulness to our children. So we don't want to despair, but we do want to pay attention to this. We do want to realize that we have a daunting task before us. But I have good news for you this morning because we have hope this morning. As Christian parents and Christian children, we have hope this morning because we have help from God. We have help from God's Word. We have help from God's Spirit, and we have help from the community of God's people that he has placed us in. So we are not people who are going to despair, but we have hope. In fact, more than just simply not despairing, I want to paint, I want to paint a picture for you this morning of, of the opportunity that we have as parents, as children in the church, as people who are called by God's name. We have a wonderful evangelistic opportunity before us. You see, I believe 
that as Christian parents and Christian children, families, we have a unique opportunity of proclaiming the gospel to the world around us simply by being different, simply by not reflecting the world, but by reflecting the God who created us. We can be faithful evangelists simply as we treasure the gospel at home. So moms that are in this room that spend most of your time at home with your kids, a lot of what you're doing is evangelistic work, not simply evangelizing your kids, but by equipping and preparing children who are going to go out into this world and to represent not just you, not just mom and dad, but the God who made them. And we just may be the means that God uses to bring many to a knowledge of the truth. So think about that for a moment. What we do at home, what we do as parents, these verses, children obey your parents, are about much more than just making it more peaceful at home. You know, those verses are not primarily about the ease and convenience of, of parents. These verses are about displaying the glory of God. Parents, by obeying God's word here, by faithfully discipling your children, you are able to demonstrate the glory of the gospel, both to your children and to the watching world around you. And children, as you obey your parents, as you relate to your mom and dad with honor and respect, you are able to demonstrate the glory of the gospel to your parents and to the world around you. This is good news. This is wonderful news. This is exciting stuff because as you know, as we see the crisis around us and among us in our community, we want to be aware that we can be used of the Lord to demonstrate his gospel, to demonstrate his glory, to proclaim the good news simply by being faithful at home. And by the way, this is a word for the whole church. So those of you who, uh, we have folks in this room who have kids who have already grown and gone. We have folks in this room who do not have children. We have folks in this room who may not have children. Uh, Maybe you're called to a life of singleness. This word is no less applicable to you this morning. You see, this this is God's word for you too. So don't check this out. You need this truth. And more than that, we need your help. Families need your help in this community. And the world needs your help to proclaim this same message to them. So with that, let's dive in to Ephesians chapter 6. So this morning, we um, if you're new with us this morning, we preach uh, expositionally. So what we do is we take books of the Bible, we walk through chapter by chapter, section by section, and we you know, just, just tackle the next section each week. So this week, we turn to the final chapter of Ephesians. We've been in this book for the better part of the last year, and now we turn to the final chapter. It's a new section as we look at the relationships and the responsibility of children and parents. But as we look at this, it's, it's important to remember the context because we never want to read one verse in isolation from what's around it. We want to read what goes immediately before, what comes after, what goes you know, well before, we want to read the books around it. We always want to be aware of the context of God's Word. And this morning, the context I want to draw you to, if you look up just a little bit to chapter 5, verse 18. John did a wonderful job preaching this um, several weeks ago. Chapter 5, verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. And then you see Paul calling us to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then down in verse 21, he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So that, that is the, that's the primary context I want to draw your attention to this morning because chapter 6 didn't just fall out of the blue. Paul's not just thinking, you know, now, now we need to talk about this. This is all Chapter 6 and you know, chapter 5, what we just spent time in the last few weeks, is all application of this section, being filled with the Spirit, living out a Spirit-filled life, living out a life, demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That's what we're called to, and now he's turning to, this is how you apply this. So, so the last couple weeks we spent time, how do you apply that as husbands and wives, and now we spend time, how do you apply that children and parents? So we don't want to, again, we don't want to divorce this from its context. 
because Paul is convinced and is here seeking to conv- convince us that living this way under the lordship of Christ, displaying the work of the gospel in our hearts, is completely foundational to the free and unhindered work of the Spirit of God in the lives of the believers in this community. An attitude of self-denial and a deep concern for the needs of others is essential to living as a Christian in the family, in the household, and in the world around us. So that's what Paul is doing here. He is showing us what it means to apply the spirit-filled life at home between children and parents. He is calling us to demonstrate the glory of the gospel to one another in the home. And now each in turn, Paul addresses first the children and the parents. And the first thing that he calls children to, if your children are like mine, they can recite this by heart. It's one of the first memory verses you want to teach them, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children, you are called to demonstrate the glory of the gospel by obeying your parents. You are called to demonstrate the glory of the gospel to your parents, to the world around you, by the way that you respect, by the way that you honor them. And I, we, we, we don't want to pass by something. The, when it talks about children here, the, the age range that he is referring to is pretty much who just stood up. So the fact that Paul is addressing children in this letter means that the assumption there is that in the, in the early church, the children were gathered together with the church. So they didn't have separate children's ministry rooms that they sent all the six-year-olds to. So you basically had these five and six-year-olds through you know, late teens, early 20s, all who are in the home still, that's who Paul has in mind. And that's a big deal, the fact that he addresses them directly. And that's, incidentally, you know, just as a small church plant, you know, we're, we're surrounded by uh, lots of wonderful, good, big, bigger churches that have thriving children's ministries. And we don't have that. We have our six-year-olds in the room. I have had my boys, I have four boys, and the younger two, thank the Lord, are in children's ministry because they're very squirmy at two and one years old. But my other boys have always been in, in here listening to the sermon. So for those of you who are concerned about your kids, I know that a number of you think, you know, gosh, my kids are you know, distracting, they're loud or whatever. Only one of us in this room has been on the stage preaching while their son did a front flip off the front row while other people who were remain, remain nameless took photos of that time while I was preaching. So if you want to talk about distracting, you are in good company this morning. So thank you. And I want to commend you, children, who are in here this morning, who are in here week after week. You you guys are an example to the rest of us. You are an example in the way that you come in and you sit in this meeting and you listen to these sermons that are usually mostly uh, addressed and directed to the adults in the room. And you guys sit here and you listen and you lean forward and many of you come forward. Some of the most meaningful encouragement that I've received in my time preaching here has been from you children coming up and sharing pictures with me or telling me what God said to you while we were preaching. So thank you. I want to commend the children of this church. So children in the church, those who are still in your father's household, this is God addressing you directly in his word. And he first of all calls you to obey your parents, for this is right. In other words, God says, this is not your mom and dad saying, obey me because I said so. This is God saying, obey your parents because I said so. This is God who created you saying, this is my law. This is right. This is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. You are not called to obey your parents out of some arbitrary reasoning. And incidentally, parents, we don't require our kids to obey simply because we said so. We require our kids to obey because they, like us, are made in the image of God. We want to train our children to, to respond to the Lord God Almighty. We want, to, we want to teach our kids, we want to model for our kids what it is for us to be under authority ourselves. So we require their obedience out of obedience to God the Father. So kids, you obey your parents because you want to obey God. 
Now, I want you to listen very, 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 very closely to me. If you, if you are a child here today, if you're a teenager here today, because you live in a culture, a self-absorbed culture that is trying with all its might to convince you that this world is all about you. You are living in a culture that spends billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars, to get you to buy that, to think that it's all about you. And it's just not, and it's just not true. And that doesn't work. Pursuing our own joy in us is just not going, to, is not going to work. Here's the truth in God's word. Children, teenagers, you are responsible to the God of the universe. God, the God of the universe created you. He has made you. And you're accountable to him for your life. So when we listen to these words in this passage, when you hear children obey your parents, this is an opportunity to worship God. This is an opportunity to demonstrate the glory of the gospel to your parents, to your siblings, to those around you. When you're with your friends and you're tempted to do things that you know mom and dad have have taught you not to do, when you are tempted to do things that you know God's word calls you not to do, and you say, no, I'm going to choose to honor God here. That demonstrates the glory of the gospel. That that shows the beauty of Jesus Christ. That shows, no, while I could do this to win your favor, to please you, to gain respect among these people, while I could laugh at that joke or do this, I'm going to choose to honor God because that's better than this. That's better than winning a temporary fame and relationship. This passage, children, is talking about your relationship with mom and dad in a way that always affects your relationship with God. You cannot disconnect your relationship with mom and dad from God. Your mother and father are called by God to set boundaries for you. They work sacrificially, tirelessly for you, for your good, and they want good for you. They're not seeking to withhold good things from you. They're not just trying to tie you and make you do things that uh, that they want. They want to instruct you in God's ways. They want you to be filled with joy that lasts everlasting and not temporarily. When children fail to obey their parents, you're ultimately rebelling against God. God created you. God gave you authorities and said, these parents are going to work for your good. And when we rebel against that, we're saying, no, God, you have not chosen well. No, God, I will decide what is best for me. God gives us parents for your benefit. And obeying their wisdom, besides being right, brings good benefit to your lives. There are good things that come with children who show respectful love to their parents. And the most important aspect of that is bringing glory to your Father in heaven. So Ephesians 6 says to every teenager, every child in the room right now, Are you honoring your mother and father? Are you respecting your parents? When you think about your parents, is it respect that comes out? Is it honor that flows out? And it leads to the second command to honor your parents with your attitude. Obey your parents with your actions. So how do you tell if you're honoring? Look at what you're doing. You you honor by listening to your parents. You show them respect by listening to them. And then you apply what they talk to you, what they ask of you. So you hear what they say. And and I'm not so far removed from being a teenager that I don't remember what that was like. I remember what it was like to listen without really listening. I remember what it was like to just kind of check out. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, Dad. There's a whole, there's there's like the switch that we just kind of turn off. But God says you listen. You listen to your parents' advice. You listen to your parents' words. You listen to your parents' commands. And God says this brings glory to his name when you do this. 
So you obey your parents by your actions. You obey your parents by listening to what they say, doing what they say. Simple, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. But I don't pretend for a second that it's that simple. I know it's not always easy. I, don't, I know that it's not always understandable. I won't even pretend that God is saying here that everything that your parents call you to do, that you're always going to like to do. In fact, the implication here is in this whole picture of training and discipline, sometimes it's just not the best news in the whole world, right? Sometimes that's, it's really difficult to hear you say, obey your parents when you don't want to. But God expects you to do things that you don't want to sometimes to obey your parents. God expects you, he commands you to do this out of obedience to the Lord to demonstrate the glory of the gospel and your trust in God Almighty. And here's, here's, here's the thing. There are, when you, when you hear these words, I'm aware that, that, you know, for some of us, and many, all of us grew up in homes, right? All of us grew up with parents. And some of us grew up with parents that did ask us to do things that we didn't feel was right. And that, if you want to think about the exceptions, if you're automatically running to, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about that? Our first impulse should not be to run to the exceptions. Our first impulse should be to run to, yes, Lord, I want to honor my parents. I want to honor you, God, by obeying my parents. But there is one exception. The one exception to this, the one out you have, is if your parents call you to do something that is clearly contrary to his word. So a number of years ago, uh, my wife and I were in a, in a church up in uh, the Dallas area, and we had a young man who, was, who we saw converted from his family's faith of Islam. And it was, it was wonderful. Our pastor led this guy to Christ. We got to hear the story. We met this man. And, uh, and we're really excited. I mean, imagine the joy that comes when you've got somebody who comes in who converts to the Lord from another religion, especially one that carries such baggage like this one. Because many of you know, if that happens, the response of the parents is what, exactly what happened with this guy. His parents kicked him out of the house. His parents cut him off. They said, you will not have any further help from us until you renounce your faith in Christ and return to Islam. And so he refused. Well, this would be this would be the one exception. Not just renouncing, not just when your parents call you to renounce your faith, but anything that runs contrary to God's word, anytime that they call you to disobey God, that is the one exception. If it goes against God's will and his word, scripture tells us never to disobey. So that is a possibility, especially in non-Christian homes, but even sometimes, you know, that could be possible in Christian homes, but that is rare. That is uncommon. Much more common is the fact that we have lots of other reasons that call us to renounce our parents' authority. We don't like them. We don't respect them. We disagree. We think that we know a better way. And sometimes you may be right. I am the first to say with my kids, there are some times that I speak to my kids and I say something I don't, I don't have the whole picture, and I call them to do something, and it's so helpful to me when my, when my children say, yes, Dad. Hey, Dad, can I ask you a question about this? Did you know, you know, so I, I, I see my kids eating an apple. I said, you know, son, I, I told you not to eat an apple. Oh, okay, yes, Dad. Did you know that Mom told me I could eat an apple? I just want to make sure that, that you know that. So this, this obeying your parents is not does not mean that you cannot ask questions. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, respond to your parents respectfully in a way that honors them. But that should be our impulse. Our impulse as children should be to demonstrate the glory of the gospel in the way that we respond to our parents. And it calls us to do more than that. It calls us to honor our mother and father. Now, obey your parents. The language here is for the children who are still in the home. For those of us who are children who are not in the home, that's all of us. We all have parents, you know, whether living or not. We all have parents that we want to continue to honor. That's not, that is a command that never goes away. So everyone in this room, we are called to honor our mother and father. Now, that looks like a lot of things for a lot of different people. So 
what we want to ask this morning is what does it mean to honor my mother and father? So for a lot of us, that means caring for our parents in their age. That means teaching our children to, to honor their grandmother and their grandfather. We want to honor them. We want to speak respectfully of them because a lot of times, and if, and if you're like me, a lot of times when you grow up in a non-Christian home, and then you become a Christian, and you have a very different way of doing things than your parents did, you, we, can, we can have a little, we can be tempted towards self-righteousness there if we're not careful. We can be tempted to look down upon, to be condescending toward our parents, and that can come off with our kids. That can come off in the way that we relate to our parents. Well, if you have, if you have any desire to lead your parents to Christ, if you have any desire to seek your children honor their grandparents, we still must always honor them. We can disagree and continue to honor. That's for all of us. And finally, Paul says that this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So what does this mean? That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So if you obey your parents, you will have a long life. If you obey your parents, everything will go right with you. Everything will be glorious. Not necessarily the case. This isn't a rigid, wooden promise in that sense. But basically, what he's saying here is that God knows what is best for you. God says, uh, God says, essentially, if you do this, If you do this, generally life goes well for you. And he, and he says this. When Paul wrote this, the, the children, the infant mortality rate was significant. And there were children who passed away at a very early age. And Paul is not unaware of that. So he's not saying it as a promise that you will have a long life literally. But that generally, it's like a proverb, like any proverb, generally things will go well for you. So children... In your obedience, as you honor your mother and father, we want to demonstrate the glory of the gospel as we obey them. That brings us to verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Fathers and mothers, this is a call for both of us. This is not a call uniquely to fathers. It's It's a call to parents both. In each of these verses, you see children obey your parents in the Lord. Children honor your father and mother. And then he turns to verse 4 and says, fathers... Now, this same word is used in other places to refer to both parents, but here he is actually uniquely saying fathers. It's showing that, just like at the end of Ephesians 5, it's showing that it's highlighting the unique role of a husband and a father of leading his home. Not sole responsibility, but the leading responsibility. So this applies to both parents, but us fathers should feel the weight of this particularly. And we need to guard this jealously. We live in a culture that that calls us to delegate this responsibility, to abdicate this responsibility. And while we can delegate parts of this, we can delegate parts of our responsibility to lead our children, to disciple our children to the church or to the school to help educate them. We can delegate aspects of that. Nobody, listen, nobody can replace you. You are not replaceable as a parent. Your role is God-given and is unique. Your children need your influence more than the teacher, more than anyone else in their life. And so we want to take that up, and we want to own that. We want to feel the weight of that. We want to feel the responsibility of that. And dads, let's not, let's not abdicate here. Let's not assume that this role is primarily for our wives. Let's not assume that this is something that, the, that our wives are primarily going to do. They may spend the majority of their time doing that, or they may not. But we are ultimately responsible for this. Uh, I heard another pastor talking about this verse, and he said, here's the, here's the picture you want to have. If, if, if my children, if this is not getting done at the home, and God comes to my house and knocks on the door, and my wife answers, and he wants an, and he wants an account for what's going on in the home, he's going to say, okay, hey, where's Aaron? Get me Aaron. I want to talk to the husband. I want to talk to the dad. He's the one who's ultimately responsible. So dads, let's feel the weight of this responsibility because in, in our culture today, it's so easy for men to abdicate, for, for us to kick, for us to punt the ball on that one. 
Let's not do that. Let's show the world what godly men, what godly husbands, what godly fathers look like. Let's demonstrate the glory of the gospel by owning this command to lead our homes, to disciple our children. God calls our children to obedience. That's their essential orientation for us. But here's the thing about that. We all know, everybody who has kids, everybody who has raised children knows that asking your kids to obey you by demand, by requiring that, that also makes them vulnerable to our sin. This makes them vulnerable. And this is why Paul goes on to give this important charge. He says, don't abuse the vulnerability of your children. Don't provoke your children to anger. Another translation says, do not exasperate your children. Listen, there is a place, there is a time, and and this happens to me all the time. I'm not standing up here as one who's got this all figured out. Just a a few weeks ago, uh, I was in a conflict with my wife, and one of my sons observed it. And he's sitting in a chair, and he watches this. And after, um, after I walked into the other room, he says, Daddy, do you think that you're honoring God in the way that you're speaking to Mommy right now? Ugh. Ugh. That was the kindness of the Lord. Now, he did that in a way that was very honoring to me. He did not rudely rebuke me, and, and, I, and I deserved a rebuke, he lovingly, patiently just said, hey, Dad, he, he didn't say it this way, but here's how I heard it. Dad, I'm watching you talk to Mommy, and I'm learning what it's like to be a dad, and I'm learning what it's like to be a husband. Is that how I should talk to my wife one day? Is that how I should talk to others when I get angry? There's a place for repentance in the life of a parent toward their children. It shouldn't be uncommon for your kids to hear you repenting. It shouldn't be uncommon for them to see you modeling what you call them to do. When we teach our children to repent, when we teach our children to respond to the conviction of the Lord by repenting, by making amends, they should see that displayed and modeled in our lives. They should hear us regularly say, son, I'm sorry. That was wrong. The way that I spoke to your mother was wrong. Would you forgive me? That was a bad example to you. That did not serve your mommy. That did not honor the Lord. Or in another instance, when I, if you, if you, if you're just having a hard time losing with your kids, they should hear you regularly say, "Babe, I'm, I'm sorry, son. I'm sorry, honey. The way that I just spoke to you, God's word says the anger of man does not, does not lead to the righteousness that God requires, and that was not." On, that was not godly, the way that I just spoke to you. Would you please forgive me? I've repented to God. I've received his forgiveness. Would you, re- would you receive my apology? Would you forgive me as well? You see, son, daddy needs Jesus' help just like you, just like you do. This is a great, this is appropriate, guys. A great deal of parenting is, is repenting. That hurts our pride. It, it stinks, right? It stinks to go to your kids and acknowledge that daddy is not perfect. But we're not. It's just admitting the truth. And, and more than that, we're setting our kids up for what the rest of their lives is. I heard a, a dear friend of mine named Bob Coughlin uh, who taught on parenting one time. He said that the chief purpose of parenting is to help your kids establish well-worn paths to the cross. Do you hear that? A chief aspect of parenting is helping your kids to establish well-worn paths to the cross. We want to teach them what it's like to repent. We want to teach them what it's like to go to Jesus with your sin and how you relate to that. We want to teach them that it's the the expectation that I have for my kids is not perfect obedience. It's not. I'd love it. It's not going to happen. I don't do it. I don't obey all the way right away with a happy heart. Now, I want to hold that out to my kids. I want to push them toward that. I do want to require that of them. And when they fail, because they will fail, then we get to teach them. We get to show them the gospel. We want to help them appreciate and glory and then delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your kids will remember your character in these moments far longer than they'll remember your rules about TV, more than they'll remember what their bedtime was at a certain age. They'll remember that moment when you got down and said, son, I'm so sorry. Daddy needs Jesus. Would you pray for daddy? They remember that. 
Because that's what life is. That's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is a lot about repentance. Paul warns us not to treat our children in such a way that leads them to anger. We don't want to exasperate our children. The command here is primarily negative. You would expect that Paul is calling the parents to to discipline their kids, and he does say raise them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. But here, he starts off with a negative command. He's primarily saying you should be restrained. This was written in a time of, of uh, in a culture of absolute parental authority. Listen, in the ancient world, there were basically essentially no limits whatsoever placed on fathers. They could abandon their children to exposure as infants. They could beat their children to death with little fear of punishment. And that was not right. That was not good. That did not honor the Lord. And so Paul's word here against fathers limited this impulse of parental tyranny. So that's not what he's calling us to. He's saying you should be restrained here. These words would have been surprising. They would have been very countercultural at the time. It would have been expected to say to the children, children, do not provoke your parents to anger. That's a lot of times what I want to say. Is I want to say, well, the reason I was angry is because you tempted me. I was angry because you provoked me. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says, Christian dads, you should be different from those around you. Paul is telling fathers to exercise a sensitivity and care in how they interact with their children, and especially in how they discipline them. We need to carefully consider the impact of our words and our actions upon these precious and vulnerable children that God has entrusted us to for a brief season. Listen to what Bible scholar Andrew Lincoln says. So what is Paul saying? Andrew Lincoln says, effectively, the Apostle Paul is ruling out excessively severe discipline, unreasonably harsh demands, abuse of authority, arbitrariness, unfairness, constant nagging and condemnation, subjecting a child to humiliation. Fathers, have mercy in all forms of gross insensitivity to a child's needs and insensibilities. John Stott adds to this and says, behind this curbing of a father's authority is a clear recognition that children, while they're expected to obey their parents in the Lord, they are persons in their own right who are not to be manipulated, crushed, or exploited. And listen, we don't want to give ourselves a pass because we're not overtly abusive. We don't want to give ourselves a pass because I've never struck my children. I've never used shame toward my children. You want to know what provokes your children to anger? Legalism, a legalistic spirit, a a spirit that, that expects perfect obedience and has no room for grace. Arbitrary disciplinary standards provokes your children to anger. When you're inconsistent with, with what you require, when sometimes You'll just put up with it for a while, and then all of a sudden you snap. That provokes your children to anger. We never want to forget that our primary difference is to image God the Father to our children. How are we doing at displaying who God is in the way that we relate to our kids? So let's not lay burdens on our sons and daughters that they can't carry, that we can't carry. Anytime that I sit there and I'm correcting one of my children, I often have tears in my eyes saying, son, I know. I know it's hard. When I called you to do this and you, and you, and you disobeyed in this way, I know, that's, I know it's hard. I, God does call you to do this. He does but you're not going to do it perfectly, and here's where we need grace. Our task is not to discourage our children, but to self-sacrificially invest ourselves, our best energy, our best initiatives. We should spend our best creative thinking considering how we can raise our children to know the Lord. They, they don't get the leftovers. They should get our best. We should take time away. There, there should be a place, if you have a busy schedule, if you, like me, work a lot of hours, there should be a place for taking a retreat, saying, you know what, we're going to prioritize this so much that I want to pull away for two days or for a day or for half a day, whatever it is that works for your family, to plan how I'm doing as a dad, to plan how we're doing as parents, to plan how can we faithfully demonstrate the glory of the gospel to our children.
And last, Paul says, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Bring them up. This is language that is best understood to nourish or to feed. In chapter 5, verse 29, Paul says, No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. We want to think about our children that way. How do we nourish ourselves? We want to nourish. We want to be tender with our children. We want to be gentle with them. They're fragile, easily broken, in need of your tenderness and the security, the security of knowing your love and affection for them. This is not modern-day psychology but clear instruction from the God of the universe to be tender, to be gentle, to nurture your children in the Lord. John Piper says this. He says, the focus here is on the fact that in all that a father does to bring his children to maturity, there should be a provision and a care that assures the child that behind all the discipline, behind all the instruction, there's a great heart of love. This earthly father is therefore working all things together for the good of his child. And in that, God's character is being displayed faithfully. That's what we want to do, dads. We want to demonstrate the glory of God. The most fundamental task of the mother and the father is to demonstrate who God is to our children. Children are learning from dad his strength and leadership and protection and provision and justice and love. They're absorbing from their mom's her care and nurture and warmth and intimacy and justice and love. And all this is happening well before your kids ever know anything about God. When your kids can't talk, when they can't understand the words that come out of your mouth, they know and they experience your love and your provision and your protection, your affection. So you want to ask, will this child be able to recognize God for who he really is in his authority, in his love, in his justice? Because mom and dad have together shown the child what God is like. That's our job, parents, to show who God is to our kids. It's a daunting task. And left to ourselves, we have no hope to fulfill it. I've blown it. I'm sure that many of you have felt that you have blown it. Maybe some here this morning thinking, it's too late. I've blown it. I've got no opportunity left. It's not too late. You can start today. We can go home today and talk to our kids and own our failures here. We can own it with them, and we can recommit with them. Let's do this. Let's follow this. Let's obey this. Let's heed God's command. Let's seek the filling of his spirit. Let's receive forgiveness from God together, and let's take steps of obedience to the Lord. And in that, let's demonstrate together. Honey, let's demonstrate together the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way that we relate to each other. I want to do that better. Daddy wants to do that better. Mommy wants to do that better. And we need God's help. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. If if you don't know how to do family devotions at home, that's okay. We're, you know, this is not, uh, this is not that. It's not simply that or primarily that. If you do nothing else, you can pray together and ask God to help us to show his glory in the way that we live out our faith at home. We want to show the watching world what a spirit-filled family, what a Christian family looks like. So in closing, let's turn our attention to the Lord and let's ask him for help. As children, we are called to obey our parents. We're called to honor our mother and father. Fathers, do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Let's together demonstrate to one another, the same way that my son demonstrated God's glory and the way that he honorably asked me a question that revealed my sin. Let's demonstrate God's glory, dads, in the way that we own our sin, repent to our wives in front of our kids. Let our kids see us do that. Let's demonstrate the glory of God in confessing together our need for God's help. Let's confess together our need for God's spirit, and let's ask God to fill us with his spirit and to do this so that we can demonstrate the glory of the gospel at home 
into the world around us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning aware of our sin and our failures, aware of our need for help from you. As children and parents, God, we feel the weight of your command to us and we're tempted to crumble under the weight of it. Father, I pray this morning that you would now apply the gospel to our lives, minister the gospel to us through your spirit. Help us, God, to see your glory and to pine after it, Father. Help us, God, to see the opportunity to demonstrate your glory and to give ourselves to that. To do that knowing that, God, <laughs> you, you just didn't come to call the perfect. You didn't come to call the righteous but sinners. And we are that. And so we are perfect instruments to receive from you and therefore to reflect from you to the world. Father, I pray for those this morning who are just aware of difficulty in our relationships right now with our children, with our parents, whether they're in the home, whether our parents are far away. Father, I pray that you give us grace today for that. I pray that you give us faith for that today. I pray that you'd remind us that we have help in you. Help us, God, to receive from you today, to reflect your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.